which define the proper spirit and content of worship. Psalms 103 was entitled A Song of David, showing us its authorship. The basic theme of Psalms is living real life in the real world where two dimensions operate simultaneously, a horizontal and temporal reality, that is, we living down here on earth, interacting with one another, and a vertical or trans transcendent reality, in which without denying the pain of the earthly dimension, the people of God are to live joyfully and dependently on the person and promises standing behind the heavenly or eternal dimension. This psalm was a psalm of praise from David's heart, but it is also relevant to all believers. We do not know the circumstances in which it was written, but since David was a man who knew the grace and deliverance of God many times, it could have been written at many different times of his life. However, Charles Spurgeon thought we should attribute it to his latter years when he had a higher sense of the preciousness of pardon because of a keener sense of sin than in his younger days. His clear sense of the frailty of life indicates his weaker years, as also does the very fullness of his principle gratitude. We as Christians believe that there is only one God who is the creator and sustainer of the world. We believe that God is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, known as the Trinity. The Trinity refers to the idea that God is one, but exists in three different persons. The word Trinity comes from the word tri, meaning three, and the word unity we may want. Today, however, I want to draw your attention to the part of the Trinity, God the Father. God the Father is described in his role as the creator and sustainer of all things. This means that he is the creator of the world and everything in it. That means me and you. Genesis 2 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God is also viewed as a loving father. This, is, this means that he cares and loves humanity as a father loves his son. This is shown in the parable of the prodigal son that is just acted out. In the parable, despite the son having squandered his early inheritance, the father still welcomes him home with open arms and a celebration. In the same way, God welcomes back those who have sinned and now seek to be reconciled with him. To preface, to preface my message, let us look at the definition of compassion. To have compassion means to empathize with someone who is suffering. And not only just to empathize and sympathize, but also to feel compelled to reduce the suffering. This morning as we examine the theme, the compassionate father, allow me to pose a few points that show God's compassion and explain them as we go down through the scripture verse by verse. I want to speak to you today about the redeeming Father, the just and righteous Father, the gracious Father, the sympathetic Father. The redeeming Father, God who forgives all your sins. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is mentioned first because by the forgiveness of sin, sin which kept us from good things, when we are forgiven, we are restored to the favor of God, which bestows 
all good things on us. Imagine how great and plentiful our sins are. And I want, as I deliver this message today, that you will really take a, a look at yourselves and think to yourselves how God has done all of this for you. And if you have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to take an inner look at yourself and understand what God is capable of doing and what he is willing to do in your life. This, this is me. Imagine how great and plentiful our sins are, yet all are forgiven through grace. God's unmerited favor. We are undeserving, yet God chooses to extend his favor. His love to us, extend his favor and his love to us. It is a continued act. He is still forgiving as we are still sinning and repenting. It would be one thing if we are, we're still sinning and God was not forgiven. But as long as we continue to sin, God will still be there to forgive us and to restore us. From the time that man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, God always wanted to bring mankind back to that state of innocence. He always wanted to bring mankind back to him. Even when we look through, we now know that we live under the dispensation of grace where Christ came as the ultimate sacrifice for us. But even when we look at the dispensation of the law, where the, the, the sacrificial lamb had to be slain every year, that was done all in an effort to bring mankind back to him. God wants to bring you back to him so that when he comes for the earth, you can enjoy the pleasures of heaven. God who heals all your diseases. God brings about healing both naturally and spiritually. But today I want to speak mainly about the spiritual sickness and disease. The corruption of nature is the sickness of the soul. And as I said, that goes back to Adam and Eve, the corruption of nature, up until that point, mankind was pure, but the corruption of nature is the sickness of the soul. It is a disorder and threatens us with death. We all must die down here. We all must die. But there is a second death. There is a second death. There is a second resurrection that has to come. And with that second resurrection, there is also the second death. When those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ shall be caught up to meet him in the air as Savior. But those who have stayed in that state of sin, Jesus will say, depart from me, I know you not. This is cured or healed in sanctification. When sin is mortified, the disease is healed. Though complicated, it is all healed. We, we may never truly understand how it works, how God forgives us. But it works, it is complicated, but we by faith believe. When we are redeemed, God makes us holy. He makes us more like him, washing and cleansing us. He heals the disease of the corrupt nature that is in us. God who redeems your life from the pit or destruction. God rescues us from sure destruction. Many calamities are spared from the child of God. God has redeemed us from the destroyer, from hell, from the second death. The redemption of the soul is precious. And again, you can't fully understand it, but God will redeem your life when you come to Christ and put it in his hands. He will redeem you. God has preserved our soul from death by dying in our stead. When Christ died on Calvary's cross, he preserved our souls from ultimate death by dying in our stead. Jehovah 3.28 says he will deliver his soul from going into the pit and his light shall see the light. Today, if you want on that last day to see the light of heaven, you must come to Christ so that he can 
redeem you from the pit of hell. God who crowns you with love and compassion. God's greatness extends beyond sparing us from sin, disease, or trouble. Though God's, through God's blessing, we are crowned with his great love and mercy. And every day we can see how God pours out his blessing. When we look at the life that we live and how we do things in spite of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and where we are now, we can say that it had to be the love and the mercy of God that has us here today. God who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The result of God's work, both in what he saves us from and what he saves us unto, is to bring true satisfaction to our lives. This is different from mere pleasure or entertainment, but it is a certain satisfaction that comes from serving Christ. There is a, although there may be trials and troubles and circumstances that sometimes may not seem so favorable to us, but God will work things out for us. God wants to bring true satisfaction to our life from good things, both the good things of this world and the spiritual things. Proverbs 8, 21 says that I may call those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. This satisfaction becomes a source of strength and energy to his people. And if we are truthful to ourselves, there are some times that we get weary and we get worn out. Hallelujah. But when we are filled with his blessing that he bestows these good things on us, it is a source of strength and energy to us that we can continue to go on in the way of God. The just and righteous Father the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. What a blessed assurance that God extends righteousness and justice to all. And I want you to focus on that word, to all. Not only his children, but to all. Up until this point, David had been praising God for the thing he had done for him individually. But here he praises God for the blessing that he bestows on all, both sinner and saint. This is a way to that God calls those who are outside of the umbrella of grace into his family. Because when we are depressed and oppressed, hallelujah, God will plead our case and he will come to help us in our most helpless season. Hallelujah, the commentator Matthew Henry in his exposition on this chapter made this comment. He's the patron of the wrong innocency. And one way or another will plead the cause of those who are injured against their oppressors. It is his honor to humble the proud and help the helpless. Today, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but today you are saying that before I come to Christ, I have to get it all together. I tell you no. Come to Christ the way you are because he is in the business of helping the helpless. And before we all came to Christ, we were helpless. But Jesus Christ saved us and brought us into the reign of grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gracious Father. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He has never been rigorous and severe with us, but always tender, full of compassion and ready to forgive. But today I urge you that yes, God is compassionate and tender and loving, but there is coming a day when the Lord will pour out his judgment. The Lord is loving and compassionate, but there's going to come a day that he's going to pour out his judgment. On the last day, if we have, have come into his grace, we will meet him as a savior and father and share in the pleasures of heaven. But if we neglect to take advantage while his grace is being poured out, we will meet him as a judge. 
But as for now, he is still loving, he is still compassionate, he is still forgiving, and he is still gracious. Since God the Father, he is slow to anger, but abounding in love. He is slow to anger, not extreme to mark what we do amiss, nor ready to take advantage against us. He bears long with those that are very provoking, deferring punishments, that he may give space to repent. Hallelujah. And does not speedily execute the sentence of his law. And he could not thus be slow to anger if he were not plenteous in mercy. The Father, the very Father of mercies and love. Sometimes when, as I said, we really think over our lives and we think where we should be and what, what when we think of the things that we do to wrong God and we think where, where we should be we can truly say that God is slow to anger and great in mercy. This is the God that we serve above him being ruler and king. He is your father. So although today we might celebrate all of our earthly fathers, today we worship and praise hallelujah, the father of the universe. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. These very human terms point to the contrast between God's generosity and the heavy-handed wrath of man who loves to keep his quarrels going and to nurse his grievances. But God, but God forgives and restores. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. David knew the slow anger and the bounding love of God personally. He knew that his sins and the sins of the people deserve much greater judgment or discipline than they have received. But God, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We understand too, we need to, to understand the extent of God's grace and forgiveness. The distance from the earth to the heavens measures the greatness of his mercy towards those that fear him, his children. But instead, we often think of God's mercy as less than it really is. It is said that a commercial, that commercial aircraft typically fly between 31,000 and 38,000 feet. And I saw that the highest it goes to is about 42,000 feet. And we see how high that is. At that height, looking down, we cannot see the ground. Today, I want you to imagine even higher. However, it is unclear, it's unclear which heaven David was talking about. Whether the atmospheric heaven, the blue sky that we see, the solar heaven, the sun, moon, and stars, or heaven, the, the place where God dwells. But whichever heaven it refers to, we can imagine the height of God's mercy and love. And this next point makes it, makes, shows that this Psalm was truly inspired by God because we can understand that at that point David did not, probably did not have a grasp of the, the, how the earth is shaped. So it says so much has removed our sin, our sins from as far as the east is from the west. It says if we travel on a globe and you begin to travel south, as if you travel north on a globe. You begin to travel south as soon as you go over the North Pole. But if you travel east, you will continue east forever. Given the true shape of the earth, east and west never meet. 
And this is how far God has removed our sins from us. And this is how far God can remove your sins from you. God, when we think about it, God has blotted out our sins. So many times we have fallen and strayed, but God has time and time again blotted out and removed. He, when we come to him and confess sincerely, he never brings back up old things. He carries our sins far, far away. The sympathetic thought of David continues to describe the abundant mercy and goodness of God, the way that a good father cares for and even has compassion on his children in their frailty and weakness. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Charles H. Spurgeon considered the many ways God may pity or have compassion on his children. And I want us to think about this. He pities our childish ignorance. He pities our childish weaknesses. He, he pities our childish foolishness. He pities our childish naughtiness. He pities our childish stumbles and fall. Because when we come to the altar, that doesn't mean that we never fall or stumble. But the sympathetic father, he understands, he walked among us over 2,000 years ago, and he understands that at some point in time, we will stumble and fall. Hallelujah. When he came, he walked among us, and he saw how humans live. Therefore, he had a greater appreciation of the frailty and the weakness of man. He pays the pain of his children. Do you think that God likes to see you in pain? No, he has compassion and wants to bring you out of that pain. He pays the child when another has wronged him. He pays our fears. He pays our fears of his children. And I want to say that this is in the present tense and carries on the idea of continuity. At this very moment, he is now having compassion on those who fear him. And God can have compassion on you if you would come to him. The compassion of God towards those who fear him are rooted in his knowledge and understanding of our inherent weakness. He knows our makeup, our fashioning. He is who created us. He is who breathed life into us. He knows us before we knew ourselves. He understands where you are at right this moment. And he is having compassion on you. He is looking down on you with tender mercy. And he's saying, I want to help you get to that place. Hallelujah, where you are right with me. I want to get you to that place that if I should call to the earth right now, that I will see you in heaven as one of my children. Considering all of this, the psalmist, the psalmist David appropriately said in verse 1 and 2, Praise the Lord my soul, all my most, my inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So when he could have after that listed all the benefits of God, Hallelujah. He had to break out in song and break out in praise. Understanding how much God has done for him. Understanding how much God cares for his children. All he can say is bless the Lord. He understood that it wasn't just something on the outside. But he understood that our inner being should praise the Lord. The way we live our lives should praise Him. And our outward body should too. It's not just singing a song. It's not just raising our hands. But our soul must magnify the Lord. And from the inside out should worship the Lord. Today I submit to you that our Heavenly Father is compassionate and loving far beyond what we deserve or can, can understand. Today, if you are one of his children under the umbrella of grace, 
This message serves as a reminder of the great compassion of our Father and urges us to praise the Lord for it. If you have wandered away from home, away from the fall, away from Christ, like the prodigal son, our forgiving, compassionate Father will welcome you back home and reinstate you to where you were before. And if you have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and been adopted as a child of God, today God calls, come. I am ready to receive you as a child and ready to receive you as my child. With all your weaknesses and imperfections, come. He has redeemed you by dying on the cross and will forgive you for he's a gracious father. I conclude by saying, remember now, come while God is pouring out his grace before the judgment. He is loving and compassionate. And let us praise him for all he has done, does, and will continue to do. Hallelujah. Today, if you are a child of God, just stand and worship the Lord. Come on and celebrate your heavenly father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He is loving and compassionate. Let us worship and bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And today, if you have wandered away and you want to come back to Christ, understanding that he is ready to forgive you, ready to reinstate you, ready to redeem you, ready to pour out his grace, come. And if you have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ the call still, come. Today is a good day to give your life to Christ. Today is a good day to be a child of God. God bless Now is the accepted time of salvation. We will not take it for granted. We will not take it for granted. Now is the accepted time of salvation. And the call still goes out. If you have not accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, the altar is open. He says he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. He is faithful and he is just. No man knows the hour, nor the day when they will pass away, nor the time when Jesus shall come. So we do not take it for granted that we have the next. Second profound. Now is the acceptable time of salvation. For we are still living in the toenails of time. You know, some say clock, clock hand is striking the other. We, 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 we can't take it for granted, but he's loving to us. Love it. And he reached down his hand for me. And he reached down his hand for me. We are called of the sun, of the beach, and the sun, of the beach, Oh, 
down his hand. The love of our Father this morning. We were lost. We were undone. With a poor or his son. Ah, but he reached down his hands. Jesus. I'm just going to say that one more time. We were lost and condemned without God or His Son. None of our accomplishments in this life cause us to be found. But Jesus, somebody said I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But the Master of the sea. Oh, and he heard my despair and cry. And today we all can say, Lord, lifting me. If not lifting you this morning, you just give God a moment of praise. Hallelujah for his love. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, we thank him for his love, for his banner over us, his love. Amen. Hallelujah. I know we usually be singing for his back, but I just need, I really need to bless God's people. So we're going to do it different today. We're going to say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord made his face shine upon you. I mean, gracious unto you, the Lord will take and grant us and grant us his peace. Now and forevermore, the Lord God is able to say, Amen. Amen. Have a good week in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.